Chapter Nine of Agnes Gray by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. The Ball. Now, Miss Gray, exclaimed Miss Murray immediately I entered the schoolroom after having taken off my outdoor garments upon returning from my four weeks' recreation. Now shut the door and sit down, and I'll tell you all about the ball. No, damn it, no! Shouted Miss Matilda hold your tongue can't ye and let me tell her about my new mare such a splendour miss gray a fine brood mare do be quiet matilda and let me tell my news first no no rosalie you'll be such a damn long time over it she shall hear me first i'll be hanged if she doesn't i'm sorry to hear miss matilda that you've not got rid of that shocking habit yet well i can't help it but i'll never say a wicked word again if you'll only listen to me and tell rosalie to hold her confounded tongue rosalie remonstrated and i thought i should have been torn in pieces between them but miss matilda having the loudest voice her sister at length gave in and suffered her to tell her story first so i was doomed to hear a long account of her splendid mare its breeding and pedigree its paces its action its spirit etc and of her own amazing skill and courage in riding it concluding with an assertion that she could clear a five-barred gate like a winking that papa said she might hunt the next time the hounds met and mamma had ordered a bright scarlet hunting habit for her oh matilda what stories you are telling exclaimed her sister well answered she no whit abashed i know i could clear a five-barred gate if i tried and papa will say i may hunt and mamma will order the habit when i ask it well get along now replied miss murray and do dear matilda try to be a little more ladylike miss gray i wish you would tell her not to use such shocking words she will call her horse a mare it is so inconceivably shocking and then she uses such dreadful expressions in describing it she must have learned it from the grooms it nearly puts me into fits when she begins i learned it from papa you ass and his jolly friends said the young lady vigorously cracking a hunting whip which she habitually carried in her hands i'm as good a judge of horseflesh as the best of em well get along now you shocking girl i really shall take a fit if you go on in such a way and now miss gray attend to me i'm going to tell you about the ball you must be dying to hear about it i know oh such a ball you never saw or heard or read or dreamt of anything like it in all your life the decorations the entertainments the supper the music were indescribable and then the guests there were two noblemen three baronets five titled ladies and other ladies and gentlemen innumerable the ladies of course were of no consequence to me except to put me in a good humour with myself by showing how ugly and awkward most of them were and the best mamma told me the most transcendent beauties among them were nothing to me as for me miss gray i'm so sorry you didn't see me i was charming wasn't i matilda middling no but i really was at least so mamma said and brown and williamson brown said she was sure no gentleman could set eyes on me without falling in love that minute and so i may be allowed to be a little vain i know you think me a shocking conceited frivolous girl but then you know i don't attribute it all to my personal attractions i give some praise to the hairdresser and some to my exquisitely lovely dress you must see it to-morrow white gauze over pink satin and so sweetly made and a necklace and bracelet of beautiful large pearls i have no doubt you looked very charming but should that delight you so very much oh no not that alone but then i was so much admired i made so many conquests in that one night you'd be astonished to hear but what good will they do you what good think of any woman asking that well i should think one conquest would be enough and too much unless the subjugation were mutual oh but you know i will never agree with you on those points now wait a bit and i'll tell you my principal admirers those who made themselves very conspicuous that night and after for i've been to two parties since unfortunately the noblemen lord g and lord f were married or i might have condescended to be particularly gracious to them as it was i did not though lord f who hates his wife was evidently much struck with me 
he asked me to dance with him twice he's a charming dancer by the by and so am i you can't think how well i did i was astonished at myself my lord was very complimentary too rather too much so in fact and i thought it proper to be a little haughty and repellent but i had the pleasure of seeing his nasty cross wife ready to perish with spite and vexation oh miss murray you don't mean to say that such a thing could really give you pleasure however cross or well i know it's very wrong but never mind i mean to be good some time only don't preach now there's a good creature i haven't told you half yet let me see oh i was going to tell you how many unmistakable admirers i had sir thomas ashby was one sir hugh meltham and sir broadley wilson are old codgers only fit companions for papa and mamma sir thomas is young rich and gay but an ugly beast nevertheless however mamma says i should not mind that after a few months acquaintance then there was henry meltham sir hugh's younger son rather good-looking and a pleasant fellow to flirt with but being a younger son that is all he is good for then there was young mr green rich enough but of no family and a great stupid fellow a mere country booby and then our good rector mr hatfield an humble admirer he ought to consider himself but i fear he has forgotten to number humility among his stock of christian virtues was mr hatfield at the ball yes to be sure did you think he was too good to go i thought he might consider it unclerical by no means he did not profane his cloth by dancing but it was with difficulty he could refrain poor man he looked as if he were dying to ask my hand for just one set and oh by the by he's got a new curate that seedy old fellow mr bly has got his long wished for living at last and is gone and what is the new one like oh such a beast weston is his name i can give you his description in three words an insensate ugly stupid blockhead that's four but no matter enough of him now then she returned to the ball and gave me a further account of her deportment there and at the several parties she had since attended and further particulars respecting sir thomas aspey and messrs meltham green and hatfield and the ineffaceable impression she had wrought upon each of them well which of the four do you like best i said suppressing my third or fourth yawn i detest them all replied she shaking her bright ringlets in vivacious scorn that means i suppose i like them all but which most no i really detest them all but henry milton is the handsomest and most amusing and mr hatfield is the cleverest sir thomas the wickedest and mr green the most stupid but the one i'm to have i suppose if i'm doomed to have any of them is sir thomas ashby surely not if he's so wicked and if you dislike him oh i don't mind his being wicked he's all the better for that and as for disliking him i shouldn't greatly object to being lady ashby of ashby park if i must marry but if i could be always young i would be always single i should like to enjoy myself thoroughly and coquette with all the world till i am on the verge of being called an old maid and then to escape the infamy of that after having made ten thousand conquests to break all their hearts save one by marrying some high-born rich indulgent husband who on the other hand fifty ladies were dying to have well as long as you entertain these views keep single by all means and never marry at all not even to escape the infamy of old maidenhood End of chapter nine